without much ado, we would like to start off the session uh, by, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Rangan Arangode. He is a consultant physician, currently working at base hospital Omagama. Indeed, he is not a, uh, a distant figure to us. He was the former physician uh, of the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. He had his MBBS from Colombo and he had his MD in general medicine also from the PGI. And he will be talking to us on COVID-19 experience at the focal point. Over to you, Dr. Narangudu. Good morning. Uh, first of all, let me thank the president and the council of the Ceylon College of Physicians uh, for inviting me to uh, do this presentation on COVID-19. Within the next 20 minutes or so, I would be uh, uh, talking to you on my experience uh, uh, on management of uh, COVID-19 uh, at uh, the National Institute of uh, Infectious Diseases, um, which has been the focal point uh, in the management of uh, COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. As you all know, uh, NIDD, or which is commonly known as <coughs> IDH, is the uh, only dedicated infectious disease hospital in Sri Lanka, uh, which has uh, facilities to uh, isolate uh, highly infectious patients and treat them. First, when you look at the global turn of events uh, with regard to this uh, pandemic, uh, on the 31st of uh, December uh, 2019, the uh, WHO country office of uh, China was informed of a cluster of uh, pneumonia of unknown etiology from Wuhan city in Hubei province in China. And there were about uh, 28 patients who have got the disease within a very short period of time. A week later, uh, Chinese scientists were able to uh, identify the full length genome sequencing of this uh, new virus, which was a beta coronavirus, which was about 80% uh, similar to the uh, 2002 SARS. Uh, COVID uh, coronavirus, and it was about 99% similar to a bat virus. So they thought uh, this uh, virus has got into the humans from bat through a uh, uh, intermediate host. Um, then this was uh, spreading rapidly in uh, all parts of China. And uh, on the 13th of January, the first case outside China was reported from Thailand. And uh, as there were more and more cases from various parts of the, the world, on the 30th of January, WHO uh, declared this new coronavirus infection as a public health emergency of global concern. Then on the 11th of February, they named it uh, COVID-19, which stands for uh, coronavirus disease 2019 and uh, <clears throat> the new coronavirus was named SARS-CoV-2 due to its uh, close uh, resemblance to the uh, SARS virus. Uh, then by uh, early March this has spread to uh, Europe and then uh, South Korea and uh, Iran and some other Far Eastern countries and uh, they were having epidemics. And WHO declared a pandemic at this stage. By the 15th of August, uh, over 21 million people have been affected or infected, and there have been over 750,000 deaths worldwide. The first uh, suspected patient of COVID-19 was uh, admitted to uh, NI NIID on the 25th of January. She was a 40-year-old Chinese lady who was touring Sri Lanka, uh, who presented to us with uh, some uh, upper respiratory tract symptoms. And uh, on the 27th of uh, January, MRI was able to uh, do uh, real-time 
trans reverse transcriptase uh, polymerase ch chain reaction rt pcr on uh, uh, nasopharyngeal sample of this patient which became positive and uh, she had only a mild disease and uh, she recovered after about uh, uh, about five days and she was discharged on the 19th of February um, since then we since then we've been getting a lot of foreigners and close contacts of them Sri Lankans uh, who we've been uh, 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 screening with uh, this uh, RT-PCR test uh, and all of them were negative until the 11th of March when we detected the first Sri Lankan patient with uh, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. He was a tour uh, guide who had a close contact with, the, with some uh, Italian uh, tourists. On the 20th of March, we had to admit our first uh, patient. Uh, we had to admit a patient to the ICU for the first time. Uh, that was a 60-year-old uh, male patient who has returned from a European country, a Sri Lankan. And uh, on the 28th of March, he uh, passed away uh, with uh, multi-organ failure. That was the first COVID death in Sri Lanka. As of uh, 25th of July, the day I uh, left uh, NIID, there have been 585 COVID-19 positive patients and we have treated 28 of them at the ICU and uh, there have been eight deaths uh, at uh, IDH. We uh, collected data from uh, 268 uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive patients uh, who got admitted from the 11th of March to 11th of May. Uh, these are the patients, adult patients uh, over the age of 14 years. And we analyzed uh, their demographic and clinical uh, features. Uh, when you look at the patient characteristics of uh, this cohort of uh, IDH patients, 75% uh, of these patients were males and uh, the rest uh, about one fourth uh, females. Uh, this uh, male prepon preponderance is uh, well documented in, uh, uh, in studies done all over the world. And uh, about 31.5% of our patients had uh, various uh, comorbidities. Uh, the commonest comorbidities were hypertension and diabetes. 16% of our patients had uh, hypertension, 13% diabetes. <clears throat> then the others, 8.9% uh, uh, had dyslipidemia, 6.2% had bronchial asthma, and uh, ischemic heart disease was uh, seen in 4.5% uh, of our patients. Then the age distribution, the mean age was 40.8 uh, years. Uh, the eldest was a 94-year-old female who presented to us with uh, some mild respiratory symptoms. She went on to develop a very bad diarrhea. Uh, anyway, she recovered after about uh, two weeks and went home uh, uh, without any complications. Uh, and we had about uh, uh, nine patients uh, over the age of 70 years. Uh, when you look at the age distribution, as shown in this graph, uh, the majority of patients were between the age of uh, 22, uh, uh, 50. about 75% of our patients were uh, within this uh, age group and the majority were 31.9% uh, were in the uh, age group 32-39%. So as you can see here, most of our patients were fairly young compared to uh, the uh, other cohort that have been uh, described in other uh, international studies. This is uh, partly because of uh, the uh, Navy cluster. We had a lot of patients uh, from the uh, Navy who were young. Symptom analysis, 29.8% uh, of our patients 
did not have any symptoms at the time of admission. And uh, about 8.9% of them went on to develop uh, symptoms later on. Uh, and 69.5% um, patients remain uh, symptomatic and 21.6% uh, remain asymptomatic. When you look at the symptoms, uh, the, commerce, the commonest uh, symptom our patient, patients had was uh, fever, which was seen in about 62% uh, 60, 60, uh, of the symptomatic patients. The second commonest uh, symptom was uh, cough, which was seen in about 58%. Uh, so throat was the third commonest symptom, which was seen in 48.1%. Uh, Shortness of breath was seen only in about 19.8%. Uh, in about 14.8% had uh, myalgia without fever. And anosmia, which is a... Uh, uh, well documented uh, symptom in this uh, COVID-19 disease was seen only in about 7.1%. Uh, when you look at uh, the data from China, this is uh, a study done on uh, 1,099 patients uh, in uh, February in China. 89% uh, of those patients had fever. So comparatively, our patients had uh, our uh, patients, uh, less percentage of our patients had fever compared to Chinese data. And uh, cough was seen in about 68%, fatigue in about 38%, and shortness of breath in about 19%. And sore throat was seen in only in about 13% of these uh, Chinese patients. So when you look at our data, uh, about half of our patients had the sore throat, which was not the usual sore throat patients get. Uh, they were describing a severe kind of uh, throat, uh, infect, uh, throat pain, uh, and they were complaining of a feeling of uh, something getting stuck in their throat, which made some people to uh, forego their meals as well. COVID-19, we have uh, four uh, categories or five categories uh, with uh, the asymptomatic group. Uh, asymptomatic patients are the ones who have uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in their uh, respiratory specimens, but they do not show any symptoms. Then uh, mild illnesses, uh, those who have mild symptoms uh, without any shortness of breath or any uh, abnormalities uh, uh, on the chest imaging. Moderate illness, uh, they have uh, more severe symptoms, but uh, their oxygen saturation remains uh, above 94% on room air. And uh, the, uh, the uh, imaging of the chest X-ray uh, shows only uh, mild involvement. And the other group is uh, severe illness. Uh, they are the ones who develop shortness of breath with a respiratory rate of more than 30 uh, breaths per minute. Uh, but their saturation remains 94% uh, 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 or their saturation is less than 94% on room air. Or the ratio of uh, PaO2, FiO2 is uh, less than 300. And they have lung involvement of uh, more than 50%. Uh, when you do a CT chest. And the critically ill patients are those who develop uh, multi-organ failure. And they are the ones who are in the ICU. So depending on that uh, classification, we, uh, we analyze the, the severity of our patients' illness. Uh, and the majority of our patients, 94.3% of them had mild to moderate illness and only 3.8% had severe illness. That is only eight patients in this cohort of uh, 268 patients. Three of them were females, five males, um, and uh, only 1.9% had a critical illness. 
they were all male patients. Uh, when you compare it with the Chinese data, uh, they have described uh, nine, uh, 81% of mild illness, 14% severe and 5% uh, critical illness. Uh, they are severe and critical uh, percentages are high. That's probably because uh, they don't admit patients who have a uh, mild illness. So comparatively, our patients, uh, most of them had uh, mild to moderate disease, 94.3%. Then out of these uh, four patients who had critical illness, uh, all of them died in this cohort uh, with a mortality rate of 1.5%. Uh, the youngest to die was a 48-year-old male who had uh, hypertension. And the eldest was a 80-year-old uh, male again. Um, and uh, all of these patients had uh, comorbidities. Uh, three had multiple comorbidities. And the youngest one, the 48-year-old, had only hypertension. We used uh, RT-PCR to diagnose these patients. Uh, we did uh, RT-PCR on uh, respiratory tract specimens. If the patient was producing sputum, we used uh, that, or else we used uh, nasopharyngeal swabs uh, to detect uh, uh, viral RNA. When you look at uh, this uh, RT-PCR test, uh, it has a very high specificity, almost 100% if it is done with the correct technique. Uh, and the sensitivity varies from 63% to 93%. Uh, the sensitivity depends on the, the, the quality of the test kit uh, and the quality and the type of the sample you take. For example, if you can take a, a lower respiratory tract sample like uh, from uh, uh, gastric uh, bronchial lavage, uh, then the percentage is about 93%. Uh, and uh, the nasopharyngeal swabs uh, have a, a, a sensitivity of only about uh, 63%. Um, in other countries, they have detected uh, viral RNA in uh, stools and saliva as well. We did check uh, our patients' uh, saliva for viral RNA, but it was not uh, sensitive enough to use, use uh, saliva as a uh, uh, diagnostic uh, sample. And one important thing is that uh, this uh, RT-PCR uh, would not uh, detect the replicating virus. It detects only uh, one or two uh, genes of this uh, whole genome and uh, the uh, appearance of genes, genes uh, in a specimen does not mean that the virus is replicating and uh, live. So it's a good diagnostic test, but it's not a, a good uh, test to uh, follow up these patients. Then uh, I, I will briefly uh, uh, tell the treatment we gave for uncomplicated patients at the at IDH. Uh, in the absence of any uh, effective antiviral treatment, our management was mainly symptomatic. We gave antihistamines and also for patients who had significant fog, we used uh, uh, salbutamol, meter dose salbutamol inhalers. And uh, when necessary, we used uh, once daily IV antibiotics to minimize the exposure to the uh, staff. Uh, we used antibiotics uh, for patients who had fever, high CRP, and uh, chest x ray changes. And uh, vitamin D and high dose vitamin C are known to uh, augment uh, the immune response in viral diseases. So we used uh, high dose vitamin C one gram daily for all these patients, whether they were symptomatic or not, and uh, vitamin D for some patients. At CQ, of course, uh, uh, there was some suggestion that CQ would uh, act against uh, this virus because it has some antiviral properties. Uh, it has been used in uh, 
SARS and MERS uh, epidemics. Uh, the initial uh, studies, one from France, showed some promising results. So we started using uh, hydroxychloroquine for our patients who had significant symptoms. Um, we used a fairly lower dose compared to what other countries used. We used a 400 milligrams loading dose and then 200 milligrams BD for uh, seven days. We didn't encounter any uh, side effects uh, for this uh, treatment, but we need to analyze uh, our uh, results to see whether this uh, treatment is effective in uh, in survival and uh, viral clearance because recent studies uh, have shown that HCQ is not effective uh, uh, as a, uh, to clear the virus or uh, there's no survival benefit with uh, HCQ. And it, there's one uh, recent study done about, it was published about uh, two weeks ago, uh, which uh, does not show any benefit uh, from HCQ as a uh, post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. Uh, in this cohort of patients, uh, we discharge them according to the initial WHO guidelines. Uh, they recommended uh, initially to discharge patients uh, if uh, two uh, PCRs are negative at least 24 hours apart and if the patient has been asymptomatic for more than three days. So initially, we used this uh, these criteria to discharge our patients. So in this cohort, uh, the average uh, duration of uh, hospital stay was uh, 23 days. And uh, eight patients stayed for more than 50 days. Half of them were females. And the patient who stayed for the longest period of time was a 41-year-old male. Uh, who had a uh, severe disease. He was in the ICU for seven days. Uh, his PCR was positive uh, uh, for 65 days. Uh, he stayed with us for 65 days uh, until his uh, two consecutive PCRs uh, become uh, became, uh, negative. So, so like this, uh, we've been doing uh, PCRs every fifth day to see uh, whether they become negative when the symptoms improve. And a lot of patients stayed for a long, long period of time uh, because though they improved symptomatically, their uh, PCR remained uh, positive. So this was uh, quite distressing for the patient as well as the clinician. And it, it was a huge uh, burden for the lab as well. And uh, recent studies have shown that the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus can replicate in uh, cultured cell cells only for about uh, one to two weeks. And patients are not infectious anymore after that. Uh, there's one study done in uh, Germany. Uh, they recruited uh, 129 patients and uh, cultured uh, their respiratory samples. And uh, the median duration of viral shedding was only seven to nine days in those patients. Uh, there was only one patient uh, who had a positive culture for till the 18th day. So uh, these uh, studies uh, made the WH, WHO to revise uh, the uh, discharge criteria in the updated uh, uh, guidelines on the 27th of May. Now they recommend uh, to discharge these patients from isolation if the patients are uh, symptomatic, symptomatic after 10 days after the onset of symptoms and at least three days symptoms free. And for asymptomatic patients, you can discharge patients uh, after 10 days, even without doing uh, any PCR test or serology. This is what is adapted in, uh, in uh, countries where uh, COVID-19 is widespread, uh, like US and Europe. Um, but in our country, as the uh, we have only a very limited number of patients and it's not in the community, uh, we have to adapt a more uh, 
strict uh, guidelines when discharging these patients. Uh, this is the algorithm we follow when we are discharging patients now. Uh, <clears throat> we do a follow-up PCR when the patient has been uh, asymptomatic for at least three days. And when the patient's first uh, PCR has been done two weeks before. So if the uh, follow-up PCR is negative, we do another PCR uh, the next day. And if that is also negative, we can discharge the patient according to the initial WHO criteria. If the PCR is positive, then we go by the uh, cycle threshold value. As you all know, cycle threshold is uh, where the number of ampli amplifications you need to uh, get the, the viral RNA. So higher the CT value, lower the viral load. So if somebody is having a CT value of more than 32, uh, we go for a uh, serology test. Where we take a blood sample and do ELISA uh, to see whether the patient is having neutralizing uh, IgG antibodies. If the serology is positive, then we can uh, discharge those patients home. Um, and if the CT value is uh, less than 32, we keep the patient for another uh, five days and uh, repeat the PCR and follow the same algorithm. So at the moment, we are using uh, serology, uh, the help of the University of Sri Jayawardapura, where this test is done, ELISA. Uh, we use it to discharge our patients and also to identify donors for convalescent plasma, which is a, a treatment which we use for severely ill patients. And also serology is important for, to, to get an idea about the seroprevalence of this uh, infection in the community and also to uh, understand antibody responses against the vaccine. So at the moment, uh, the spread of the virus is well contained in Sri Lanka. The mortality rate has come down from 1.5% in this cohort of our patients to about 0.3%. And our patients are going home early. So with these positive notes, uh, I would uh, conclude my uh, presentation. Before that, I would like to thank uh, these uh, lovely people from NIID. Uh, Dr. Hasit Attanayaka, Director, uh, then the consultant physicians, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, Dr. Damianti Dampitiya, Dr. Situmini Pahala Damage, and then uh, Mrs. Geetani Udukam Porala Matron, NIID, and uh, Kumari, Ms. Kumari Amarasina, Nursing Officer Isolation Unit, NIID. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naranguda, uh, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we congratulate uh, uh, you. Uh, and uh, the rest of the team at uh, the National Institute of Infectious Diseases for the job that you have done, the great service that you have done. Um, uh, we would like to uh, invite uh, the audience to uh, pose in questions to our question and answer panel. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Narangode uh, the million dollar question that is always there. Uh, in, term, in terms of uh, managing COVID in our country. Uh, what are the other factors that actually helped us? What, what do you think? What are your personal reflections as to why we, our story has been yet uh, uh, a successful one? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, one main thing is we have been able to contain the virus. Uh and uh, we have managed to uh, avoid uh, a community transmission. Uh, so uh, we don't get many patients. Our uh, health uh, system is not overburdened. So we can admit all our patients and uh, look, out, look after them from the beginning. I think that's the main reason uh, why we have been uh, successful in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, reducing our mortality rate uh, because our patients, all of them get admitted uh, and they are under medical supervision from the very beginning. So when you intervene early, uh, you can uh, save uh, most of these patients. We have a room for one more question. Um, 
what are the reasons for less number of critically ill patients in Sri Lanka compared to other countries? And also, uh, there's a question. Do we still use uh, HCQ for symptomatic patients in uh, treating COVID-19? Yeah, if I answer the first question, uh, uh, that is uh, our, as our data show, uh, we have a very small percentage of uh, severe and critically ill patients. Um, and uh, Chinese data show that about 20% of their patients are in the severe uh, uh, group. Uh, that is probably because uh, they are the, the mild to moderate uh, disease percentage is less because they don't admit all these patients. So when they admit uh, patients, uh, they have uh, significant symptoms and uh, that's why they are, now they collect data from these the, the hospitals. These are hospital data. So they are uh, the uh, severe and the critically ill uh, percentages are high uh, because of that reason. Whereas we admit all the patients, even if they are asymptomatic. So majority of our patients, uh, when you take the percentage, uh, about 94% uh, of them are either in uh, mild or moderate disease. We need because uh, initially when we use HCQ, uh, uh, we uh, noticed that if we start HCQ early, uh, then the patients were not going into a severe or critical uh, illness um, that we have to evaluate uh, uh, further with the control study. At the moment, uh, we are using it because uh, we have not encountered any uh, side effects to this uh, HCQ. Uh, because some countries, they have uh, reported cases of uh, long QT and various other cardiac complications. Uh, but we have not encountered any of those uh, complications, maybe because we are using a, a smaller dose. Thank you.